Hello and welcome to the latest in our series of IET Eng Talks, Geoengineering in Case of Emergency Break Glass. My name is James Rowbottom and I'm the Sustainability and Climate Change Lead here at the IET. Now, you may be wondering at this stage, what exactly is geoengineering? Well, we hope at the end of this hour, you will know a far lot more. We have some brilliant experts with us. Uh, we'll have some fascinating takes on the topic. But we also want you, the audience, to get involved. There is a live discussion broadcasting on YouTube. So if you have any questions, please do get in touch with us. We'd love, love to hear from you. All you need to do is post your questions and comments in the chat box. And if you can see on your screen, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. With me today, we have two leading experts in the field. The first is Dr. Pete Irvin, lecturer in climate change at University College London and Dr. Rupert Reed, Associate Professor of Philosophy, Green Party campaigner, and former spokesperson for Extinction Rebellion. Thank you very much for joining us today. Now, before I hand over to our two experts and we get to hear their thoughts and opinions, I've been asked to provide a very brief in outline to what geoengineering actually is. We'll see how I get on. Geoengineering or climate engineering is the deliberate and large scale intervention in the Earth's climate system for the purposes of offsetting climate change. Now, there are two generally accepted methods for this. The first is carbon dioxide removal. It basically says what it does in the tin there. It's the large scale extraction of CO2 from the atmosphere. Now, that CO2 is remo removed and then stored or converted so it can't be put back into the air. For example, turning it into charcoal that can be buried or trapping it at the bottom of the oceans. So this, this is option one. However, the focus of our discussion today will be on option two. Now, option two is solar radiation management or SRM. It's basically a way of saying that we are influencing the amount of sunlight that reaches the earth. Now, there are a number of proposed ways that we could do this. Some suggest large satellites orbiting space, some suggest engineering more clouds. Some suggest changing the brightness of clouds to reflect the light back out. Other ideas include man-made structures on the surface of the Earth to reflect the light back into space before it can be absorbed by the environment. But the question for us today, and we'll be exploring, how, how does limiting the amount of sunlight absorbed into the atmosphere offset that climate change? So, Pete, if we can start with you, can you explain if you think geoengineering is a real possibility in helping us reverse climate change? I'd be happy to. So, um, yeah, my talk here is titled, Should SRM, Solar Radiation Management, Be Part of Our Response to Climate Change? I just want to set the scene a little first uh, with a very important result that's come out of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, recently. And that's that every ton of CO2 that we emit adds to global warming. And this plot that you should see shows global temperature over time on the vertical axis. You can see the year-to-year -year wiggles in temperature rising as we go to the right. But rather than against time, what we're plotting here is against the total amount of CO2 that's being added to the climate system by humans. And what you can see emerge is this really linear relationship. The more CO2 we add, the warmer the planet gets in a fairly straightforward way. Now, that's held up to today, and into the future we expect it to continue to hold, but we have some control here. The sooner that we cut emissions to net zero, the sooner we will stop global warming. And if we keep accelerating emissions, emiss the climate will keep warming. So, how are we doing? Um, the world came together in 2015 at Paris to agree the climate agreement there with the goal of limiting warming below two Celsius and ideally below one and a half Celsius. And you can see on this plot, that we're pretty close, we're already at 1.2 Celsius today, so we're very close to that, um, that target. If countries continue doing what they're doing today, follow through on their current policies, we, or the climate action tracker here, reckons that we will see around three Celsius of warming by the end of the century. Now there's some uncertainty there, it could be lower, could be higher, we're not quite sure how sensitive the climate is. They also analyze how much we warming we'd get if countries follow through on their current commitments to cut emissions. And it'll make some difference, but we still would be on track for around two and a half Celsius of warming by the end of the century. Now, as the planet warms, a whole set of risks are gonna grow, and we can talk more about that later. But 
it's clear that current policies, current commitments are insufficient to limit warming to one and a half Celsius. Now, this has led some of us to start taking seriously a kind of radical proposal that we could arrest global warming by increasing the amount of sunlight that's reflected by the planet. And the leading idea, there's several out there, but the one that really is standing out as the most feasible is to mimic the cooling effects of large volcanic eruptions. Uh, and this event in particular gives us a lot of the data for that. This is the eruption of the Mount Pinatubo in 1991 in the Philippines. Now this was one of the most powerful eruptions in recent history. So powerful that the volcanic plume that you can see the very bottom of there pierced up into the upper atmosphere, into the stratosphere, a stable layer of the atmosphere above most clouds. Now, along with all the CO2, rock, ash, and so on in this plume, there was 10 to 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide. Now, this was the important component for the climate. This sulfur dioxide reacts with oxygen, with water, to form tiny sulfuric acid droplets. And the winds in the stratosphere spread that very quickly around the whole tropics and then towards the poles, creating a global layer of particles. They persisted for only a couple of years, but in that time, they cooled the planet by around half a degree Celsius. The idea, stratospheric SRM, is to mimic that cooling effect, but not by setting off more volcanoes, but by doing it with aircraft, lifting tens, or lifting a few million tons of sulfur dioxide to the stratosphere with aircraft. Now, every engineering assessment to date has come to the conclusion that this is both feasible and relatively cheap as in using aircraft like the ones shown here, we could do it at a cost of only around $20 billion per year. We could offset one Celsius of warming. The difference between where we're currently headed if countries follow through on their commitments and where we'd like to be limiting warming to one and a half Celsius. Now, these aircraft would be new. Most aircraft don't fly so high, but it's perfectly doable. The aircraft here you see just has larger wings a narrower body and more engines, but all of this is with existing technology. Now, something I think we'll both want to make very, very clear over this talk, over this debate, is that SRM, any kind of SRM, cannot solve climate change. It is no substitute for emissions cuts. Uh, now, while it does quite well in offsetting many of the risks of climate change, because many of them are tied to temperature, it doesn't perfectly offset the effects of climate change. It only masks the warming from CO2. The problem is still there underneath. This is something that would treat the symptoms of climate change, not the root cause. Third, it doesn't address some of CO2's direct impacts, most important of which is ocean acidification. The CO2 that we're adding to the atmosphere is being added to the ocean too. That's acidifying it, and that's harming uh, shell-forming organisms. And four, it has a set of serious side effects. Now, this, air, this layer of particles in the atmosphere would scatter light back to space, but it would also scatter light downwards we'd have sky that's a bit hazier than it is today. We would also see an addition to the current acid rain problem because we're adding sulfuric acid to the stratosphere. This will add to that problem. And it would delay the recovery of the ozone hole by some decades. So for all of these reasons, SRM cannot solve climate change. The question is, could it help? And now, while research is at an early, day, early stage, I've been working on this for 12 years, and there are now hundreds of papers on the topic, but it's still at an early stage, those climate modeling studies suggest that it could substantially reduce climate risks. But we do not know enough today to confidently get, have an answer to this question. Should SRM be part of our response to climate change? Instead, we need much more research, much more international cooperation, and much more public discussion like um, this debate today. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Pete. Um, I was going to ask you a question, uh, Rupert, but I think Pete's already uh, asked the question there. So um, welcome, Dr. Rupert Reed. Um, should SRM be part of that solution? <laughs> yeah, so I'm delighted that we're discussing this here today. Um, I'm going to name three reasons why I'm delighted. Firstly, because virtually all the Paris scenarios require geoengineering. Uh, this is a, a little known fact, which someone who's coming from the kind of perspective that I come from finds really pretty disturbing. Uh, we need to shed a light of publicity onto this matter. Second reason, there will, in any case, be more and more public calls for geoengineering over the coming decade as the climate situation becomes more desperate, as it will. Uh, when this COP fails us, as it will, uh, the sooner we 
take this seriously, the sooner we start talking about it publicly, the better. And thirdly, and this is the most interesting reason, because discussing this makes the crisis real to people. Unlike bland talk of net zero 2050, which just seems to kick it off down the road into the future. If you tell people there are people thinking now about putting mirrors in space, then not to put too fine a point on it, the response of many ordinary people is, wow, if they're contemplating something as mad sounding as that, then this must actually be a deadly serious crisis, as of course it is. So it's really good to talk about this. And those are three key political and psychological reasons for doing so. But I want to deepen these with some philosophy, because deep ethical and epistemological and metaphysical issues are raised by this entire discussion. What do I mean by that? I mean questions of whether we can be in control of our entire planet's destiny, as well as whether even if we could be, we should be, and of what kind of beings we are attempting to be if we attempt to engineer the fate of the entire globe. My key philosophical question for us here is this. Faced with the situation of our having blundered unknowingly into knocking a complex system out of balance, do we complicate that system further, as geoengineering would have us do, or do we seek to go into reverse gear? To make less impacts rather than more, to simplify rather than to endlessly complicate, each intervention making the whole more fragile, dependent on ever longer and higher supply lines. My key philosophical claim is that our current plight is a result of us having overcomplicated and perturbed. To introduce yet another intervention is just more of the same, and that would exhibit a failure to learn as well as hubris. Geoengineering, especially via SRM, is reckless. We need to be precautious instead to build down our impacts. There is no alternative but the hard graft of reducing our climate deadly emissions. Picture the situation like this. There's a bathtub filling up with hot water rapidly from a tap. Do you attempt to suck water out from the bath? That's what CDR, carbon dioxide removal, is, is doing. Do you attempt to put a filter over the water while it's pouring in? That's roughly what SRM is trying to do. Or do you turn off the tap? But that's the very thing we seem to find impossible. The ideology of progress has led into this nemesistic situation, the situation of us not being able to really contemplate turning off the tap. But it's hubris to think that an accentuation of the same trend can lead us to escaping the nemesis. So do we plunge further still into the self-defeating path of domination of nature, of the fantasies of endless growth and endless progress? Or might this be the point where we finally understand that we live in a world that we'll never fully understand, let alone control. We have incredible techno power now, but we don't have power over that power. We constitutively lack the ability to control the unanticipated effects of our technology. If we geoengineer in just the same way, we won't have power over that power. Terrible side effects have come from fossil fuels. And we're gradually learning of the terrible side effects coming from plastic and certain other chemicals at scale, especially in the oceans. Just because geoengineering is well-intentioned does not in the slightest make it immune from having such effects. Such effects are already clearly visible with large-scale biofuels and biomass, which I remember in its early days being hailed as an alleged green solution to the climate emergency. And it's the closest we have to a precedent working model of geoengineering. And bear in mind, no experiments are possible with geoengineering. You either implement it at scale or you're not doing geoengineering. Modeling and small scale proof of concept experiments are not geoengineering. The precautionary principle enjoins that where there is a safe path available, gambling with our kids' future is unacceptable. That dictum applies equally to global fossil fuel addiction and to geoengineering. I want us to talk more about geoengineering 
precisely to help fuel our determination to take a path that actually is ecologically safe, namely a crash course emergency emissions reduction program and a program of transformative adaptation to the climate damage that is here and the worst damage to come. Thank you, Rupert. That was excellent. And I wonder, before we um, move to some of your questions, uh, I wonder if you both like the opportunity to just uh, have a reflection on that. So, uh, Pete, have you got a couple of minutes to reflect on uh, what Rupert has just said? Sure. I think it's worth distinguishing between carbon dioxide removal and solar engineering. Um, carbon dioxide removal is thoroughly integrated into current climate policy scenarios. So the scenarios that achieve one and a half Celsius, all of them include CDR, but none of them include solar engineering. It's not part of the mainstream discussion of uh, climate change. So those scenarios do not include it. It's something that's being discussed uh, mainly on the sidelines of the climate debate. Um, that's a minor thing. But um, yeah, so the question is, would adding a new intervention into the system make things more unstable? It seems quite intuitive to think that adding a second type of intervention, you know, we've got CO2 warming the climate, you'd think adding something else would double our uncertainties. This is simply not the case. We know that many of the deepest uncertainties, many things that we worry most about in the climate are the systems that are affected by climate. So we don't know how much we can warm the permafrost before its emissions of CO2 and methane will rival our own. We don't know how rapidly the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets will collapse as the planet warms. And we don't know how far we can push ecosystems like coral reefs, how high we can drive temperatures before they'll go extinct. In each of those cases, the thing that is driving those impacts is rising temperatures. And if we know anything about the effects of um, stratospheric SRM to date, we know that it could reduce temperatures fairly uniformly across the world, reducing many of those impacts. So in some way, yes, we'd be doing something novel. We'd be doing something different. Uh, but as many of the impacts of climate change, and it's the impacts of climate change that are motivating us to act on climate change. Many of those are driven by temperature, and many of those would be reduced by this idea. OK, so um, there's something in that, clearly. But look, uh, here's an example of where the, the logic of that uh, runs out. We are just learning now about just how catastrophically we've messed up uh, the oceans. There is evidence emerging that suggests that um, overfishing uh, may be um, as major a contributor to global overheat um, as fossil fuels. That's a recent uh, uh, peer-reviewed uh, paper. There is evidence uh, emerging that uh, ocean acidification may be being substantially driven by the amount of plastics uh, and chemicals in the ocean, and not just by rising temperatures. Now, as uh, Pete made clear in his presentation, uh, a key issue with solar radiation management, uh, so-called, um, is that it would uh, allow uh, ocean acidification to continue to, uh, to, to let rip. Um, and it may be that we, uh, that we come to learn, uh, as I think we are coming to learn, uh, that uh, ocean acidification um, and uh, other aspects of damage that we're doing to, to oceans, which are not directly tied to temperature increases, are as serious or even more serious than temperature increases. So basically, we've got a, an incredibly complex system, uh, that who, our understanding of which um, is always more limited than we would like to be the case. Um, uh, and I'm literally extremely worried uh, that if we go down the path of, uh, of SRM in particular, uh, and geo geoengineering um, in general, uh, then we're placing ourselves at more risk rather than less risk of, uh, of fatal consequences. Yeah, I, I suppose it, it comes down to there's, there's a clearly a time scale piece. And I don't think anyone up, uh, any of us up here don't think that there are huge steps to be taken in everyday life. And we've talked about this, the steps that governments need to be taking right now. Um, the question for me, and, and coming, I suppose, from an engineering perspective where we have uh, the ability to look longer term with the academia and the engineering profession than perhaps governments can. Is, I, I, I would sit here slightly fearing that if, if someone like Pete wasn't working on geoengineering and hadn't been looking at it for the last 12 years, we may get to a point in 40, 50 years time where we wish we had. Um, do, you, do you see, I suppose the question I've got is, is do you see um, 
the, the pursuit of, of geoengineering as a study area helping or hindering it? And, and do you worry that there could be governments taking it on board and just hoping that's the silver bullet? Oh, um, I, I'm totally with you there, James. Uh, and let me be very, very clear in case it's not clear from my remarks already so far. I'm really glad that Peter and his colleagues are doing the work that they're doing. As I said very explicitly in my talk, I think it's really important that we discuss this. But I think it's really important that the discussion takes into account um, all aspects. It has to take ethics fully seriously, it has to take philosophy uh, seriously in the way I started to uh, sketch. It has to be um, publicly and politically uh, engaged. Um, if there is to be a decision about uh, implementation of any of these technologies, uh, it needs to come thr through um, as a result of a wide uh, public debate. Uh, and as I hinted at the start of uh, my remarks, part of my fear so far is that geoengineering has, has lurked in the, in the shadows. So I think there's, uh, there's no dispute there. Um, I would like to see the academic programs that are being um, carried out into geoengineering have a more substantial uh, component um, drawing on the uh, humanities uh, and have uh, a more substantial, if you will, public outreach dimension. Yeah, I think then to, to hand to you, Pete, on that, on that point, um, to what extent have there been sort of humanities involved? And, and um, we talk a lot about the challenges of getting people to do even simple things like their, their switch their heating. Is this something that the public or, or, or perhaps non-engineers are able to grasp the concept of? And, and is it something that we can even start to talk about yeah. with them? Well, I, th I think it's worth going back to a point Rupert made a moment ago about uh, ocean acidification. Because I mean, as I mentioned, this idea does not address the root cause of the problem, which is the buildup of CO2. And one of its serious side effects is ocean acidification. Now, it is likely to have some potential benefit in that by reducing temperatures, it's going to reduce permafrost melt and, and losses, and potentially also reduce the loss of soil carbon that we expect in a warmer world as higher temperatures lead to a faster overturning of the carbon stored there. So there, there's some modeling su that suggests it could have some benefit for ocean acidification, but for the most part, it does not address the problem. So if, as we, I think, both fear, it could, if there was a slip, if emissions continue to rise and this was adopted, then yes, ocean acidification would continue to develop. But I think we'd both want to see that not happen. If this idea did get taken seriously, did get developed, myself, you, I think every researcher working on this topic would try as best as they could to insist that we do not see this as a substitute. Um, but to come to the humanities, um, the humanities have been seriously involved in this topic from, from the early days. I think from the earliest reports on this, the Royal Society did one in 2009, uh, there's been a clear understanding that humanities, politics, uh, governance is gonna be key to this issue. And has been, like, I, I'm not sure exactly on the ratio, but. I believe it's probably at least two thirds to one third science to the humanities. It's a really strong, it's really interdisciplinary research. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think in terms of public understanding, I mean, one of the reasons I got into this topic is I did quite esoteric physics as an undergrad and I saw this PhD topic and I thought this is something everyone can understand. There's obviously some science that has to be unpacked and that's quite complicated, but everyone can appreciate the serious choice that that would be to, to intervene in the climate to try and cool it. Um, which is why I think it's great to have an event like this. I'm sure everyone's following so far, I hope. Yeah, absolutely. Can I just so, yeah. respond on the okay. ocean acidification point a bit more? So um, look, one aspect of this that we haven't talked about yet is that uh, is there's a well-known reason for fearing that if we go down the SRM path, uh, then we will be opening up the situation for uh, ocean acidification to let rip. And the reason is so-called moral hazard. Uh, what that basically means is that um, if people um, actually come to believe, I don't think this will happen if it's, if it's properly publicly debated, but if people were to come to believe that this really was um, the, this, the closest we have to a solution or that this is going to be something which is going to give us a big breathing space or something, the hazard is that people would then say, ah, phew, so we don't have to worry so much about, uh, about tightening our belts and reducing our emissions. My view is that we absolutely need uh, an emergency crash emissions reduction program and a more general program of reducing the, the damage that our industrial civilization is doing to our life support systems, including crucially uh, our oceans. And I think that if SRM were to be 
successfully sold and then perhaps implemented uh, as a way of, of, uh, of buying us time and reducing our, our worry levels, mm -hmm. it would precisely open us up to, to, the, to the moral hazard. It would precisely open us up to not then moving along this kind of emergency uh, path I would like to see us moving along. Yeah, that's, um, thank you. I mean, we're, we, the, the tricky with all, with all debates like this is that you end up um, potentially shifting away from talking about geoengineering and getting into some seriously large conversations about uh, action, non-action, and, and a lot of the questions coming My point that. is that that, that is the yeah. conversation about geoengineering. That's the conversation we need to have. Okay, yeah, yeah. perfect. I mean, um, I've had a few questions now come through. So we're having the, the questions here about, um, there's a few saying it's, is this just going to simply delay the problem for the future? Is the danger, as you just said, um, just doing that? I, I wonder if we could sort of have a little further look on the geoengineering uh, specifically. And, and um, Matt Forst has asked, uh, what about the other geoengineering? So there's been a question here about, um, do we know? We don't know, know if SRM will work. Do we know when we'll know? But are there other geoengineering possibilities that um, for example, don't have this ocean acidification problem or... Well, I mean, first, let's be clear. Stratospheric SRM, any of these SRM things do not cause ocean acidification. Adding CO2 to the atmosphere is what causes ocean acidification. The worry is that this will distract us from cutting emissions. But I think as we both made clear, this is not a substitute for emissions cuts. And I think if anyone takes anything away, just take <laughs> away that. This is an idea that might work. And on, on the point of whether stratospheric SRM would work, I think we can be very confident that it would. There is little doubt that volcanoes cooled the climate. They add millions of tons of sulfuric acid to the stratosphere, this forms tiny droplets, and it scatters light to space. It's fairly straightforward. That would work. And the engineering assessments all come to the same conclusion. We can fly to 20, 000, or sorry, 20 kilometers, 60,000 feet, with new aircraft, and we can do this at a relatively low cost. We can do it. The question is, should we? And we need to understand its, its consequences. Can I just come back on the point about, about Pete saying it's not a substitute for emissions reductions? And it's, it's always great to hear uh, Pete or people in his kind of position saying that. But my worry is that there are going to be a lot of people out there who are accidentally or deliberately not going to hear that or not going to act on it. So if we think about some of the actors in the world today, uh, if we think about some of the powerful people who are going to be coming to COP shortly, people like the government of Saudi Arabia, people like the government of, of Russia, people like the government of, of Australia, people, frankly, like the government of the United Kingdom, actually, if you strip away all the, all the green crap rhetoric uh, of our government. Um, and those governments, we know that they, would, they, are, they are looking for any excuse to not get serious about emissions reduction. And they are going to use this as an excuse. And we know that. We, we know that they will try to do that. We know that there are many actors who will try to do that. So we ought, we ought to have some pretty good assurances, better than, you know, than Pete's, I'm sure, you know, completely 100% honest assurances. We need to have some better assurances that that's not going to be the actual effect on public discourse and the actual effect on, uh, on real politique. Yeah. I, mean, I guess I'd just say that I don't know a single researcher on this topic who would support that view that we should substitute this from emissions cuts. That, that's great, but the research, with all due respect, researchers on the topic are not going to be the ones who have the power to decide these questions. The ones that have the power to decide these questions include governments and, to some extent, powerful corporations. And uh, here's, 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 some, here's a prediction for you. I predict that in the next few years, you will see some of these governments and some powerful corporations, because of course there's, there'll be money to be made in this as well, um, coming out and saying, this is the way to go. And they may even say, you know, of course we don't regard this as a substitute for emissions reduction, but if you look at, if you look at the, the actual record um, and policies and, and even the pronouncements, frankly, of governments like the Morrison government in Australia or the Saudi, uh, the Saudi government, that these are people who will, without doubt, use this as an excuse for, uh, for not doing what needs to be done. Yeah. Um, I think there's an interesting question then, and, and it's something obviously we talk about as a professional engineering institution here where we have academic members, we have engineers. Um, there's always been a, a sense, at least, um, that you can engineer your way out of, of issues, and clearly new technology and shift in technology will, will 
form a part of that solution and and we've sort of, we've talked a lot about that need for emissions reduction is there anything that the academic and the engineering community can be doing to try and influence those policymakers and those those governments um, that you're talking about to to change the way in which they come because clearly if we go down a, an SRM route, there will be a point where we require funding for this. And the danger is in that kind of conversation that you start to over egg what the possibilities are or have to, it's a competitive place. There are other, for example, SRM or other technology. Um, do you think that the political system at the moment can handle that kind of? <laughs> well, I think it's worth looking at the Royal Society in 2009 and the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine in the United States just recently both recommended substantial research spending on this topic. So the UK, Royal Society, 10 million per year for the next 10 years. Um, the NAS recommended 100 to 200 million dollars be spent over the next five years. Just last year they recommended that. Hasn't been implemented yet. But when, in those recommendations, they made very clear, this is not a substitute for emissions cuts. We can't take our eye off the ball. We need to focus on that. Practically, I mean, most papers on this topic have that statement somewhere. You know, we, this is not a substitute. We can't forget about the near-term things. And I think, you know, while nations could tell stories, whether they have an impact on the public or bought internationally and have an impact, depends. And, I mean, we can look to the UK. I mean, you, the UK had a conservative government for the past more than 10 years. They started researching on this topic in 2011, 2010. They continued research for about four or five years. It ended. And in the meantime, their ambition on climate was raised, and they've cut emissions now by around 50% from the 1990 level. So in the UK, under a conservative government, we didn't see that moral hazard issue turn up. This is not to say there's not a threat that we should guard against and that we've got to develop communication and messaging that really strongly tells people this is not a substitute. But we haven't seen it this, this worry materialize yet in the world. Well, well, we have seen it to some extent in the United States. You've got hard right think tanks who've been pushing this stuff for, for years, and people like Newt Gingrich who've been arguing for it for years. Just a point of factual correction on, on our record in the UK. Of course, the real reduction since 1990 has been about 15%, not 50%, i.e. when you take into account all the emissions we've exported, all the air emissions, all the sea emissions, etc. So actually, actually, our record it, it mustn't swallow the government propaganda on this. Our record isn't that good. But that's a side issue to, to this debate. In terms of the question about what engineers can, can do, look, I, I agree with what, what Peter's said. But I would go further in the following uh, way. Um, I think it would be wonderful if engineers would engage um, more. I accept that some of this is happening. But if engineers would engage more with ethicists, with um, thinkers who are, who are engaging in risk analysis, with philosophers, et cetera, to, to have um, the, the big debate, the big debate we're trying to have here today, um, uh, about uh, whether or not this is a good path uh, to go down, all things considered. Um, and I think it'd be wonderful if, as well as considering this incredibly bold, you know, sort of super Promethean, I called it hubristic uh, ambition of controlling uh, the Earth's climate, I think it would also be wonderful for engineers to contemplate having some uh, humility. Uh, and to think about how we could go into a future where we tried to be um, less humble, uh, sorry, more humble, rather than always less humble as we have been uh, uh, to date. Um, and to consider seriously questions like, um, uh, is endless so-called progress, is endless so-called growth, is endless technological uh, so-called improvement um, actually uh, what humanity uh, needs uh, at this moment in history? You know, that's, a, that's a big ask, but I think that would be a, a really exciting thing for, um, for academics, intellectuals, um, engineers, uh, technologists, et cetera, to engage in together as a big, as a big discussion. Yeah, certainly. Um, I, I, questions like that inherently put people at the, at the heart of it. And, and we've had some questions here about uh, SRM more particularly, but, but it would inherently, um, as many of these, these solutions that we're talking about in terms of carbon reduction, reduction need to be delivered at this global level. And we've talked about specific governments here funding uh, specific projects or, or their, their specific government's targets for countries. I mean, I suppose it's to you, Rupert, more than anything. Do you see a level of optimism about the way that we can work together across governmentally and, and globally? Because this is not something that we're going to be able to do on a country by country basis. Yeah. Or, and indeed, the emissions reductions aren't. So, 
in terms Although, of course, of that's one of the worries about uh, SRM, that it could, uh, in principle, be implemented in a non-global way. I mean, it could be inf implemented by, by one or more countries, um, and then it would affect the, the whole globe. And that's a, that's a worrying kind of scenario that needs to be uh, seriously considered. I know it has been sort of um, game theoretically kind of worked through to some extent already. We, we need to... We need to be uh, clear about that. Look, as I hinted at early in my, in my talk at the start, uh, my view is that the situation that we're in is, is deeply desperate. And of course, the reason why geoengineering is being seriously considered is because the situation is desperate. I share the desperate desire to avoid civilizational collapse and a kind of uh, a meltdown which would make something like the coronavirus look, look trivial. Um, I don't share the desire that is present in, among some of those who are in favour of, uh, of geoengineering to um, maintain our industrial growth society no matter what. I think we need to be ready to ask bigger questions. Should we be trying to maintain uh, that kind of society? But the situation is desperate. COP26 is not going to sort this situation. My view is that the most important thing we need um, is for a much deeper, wider uh, wake-up call for people to realize how desperate the situation is, that there are no cavalry riding to the rescue, that desperate plans like SRM are therefore going to be wheeled in uh, over the coming decade. Um, and for people on that basis, I hope, to rise up in a way which is uh, bigger by orders of magnitude than what we've seen so far with Extinction Rebellion or even the school climate strikes. That's my greatest hope for how we're actually going to get through this. Oh, yeah, yeah, please, I mean, please do. I guess I, you've, you've said previously, talking about collapse, I, I have this quote from you from 2019, that if we stick to what is in the Paris Agreement, then during the century and possibly during the next generation, society, this civilization will be finished. We're talking about collapse, we're talking about the potential for a series of events that will make the Second World War look relatively minor. We're talking about multiple holocausts. I guess I'd have thought, given that you think that's likely on our current path, or certain on our current path, surely it will also be likely even under fairly rapid emissions cuts. Given that, should we not be considering something radical like um, solar radiation management as a way to avert that crisis? Well, look, I agree we should be considering it in the kind of hypothetical way we're considering it here today and, and as part of a broader uh, debate. Why do I not want to go down that path? Well, look, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of turn it around and give you a reason why. One of the key problems with, uh, with SRM um, is if you get started on it, you're basically on a, on a ratchet that you can never get off. SRM presupposes that it's going to have to go on for as long as we have a destabilized climate, which probably means centuries. It certainly means many, many decades. That means you have to presuppose that we're going to be able to have the capacity to go on delivering that kind of uh, technological uh, intervention. I'm very skeptical of that. Right? I think that it's quite possible that, that even if we try SRM or whatever, um, um, and, and one of the reasons I believe this is because of the ocean acidification stuff I mentioned earlier, um, that actually uh, we're still quite likely to get uh, eco-driven societal collapses occurring. So now, picture the scenario. Things are, this, this is not what I want to happen. This is what I think may well happen, right? Picture the scenario. It's, it's 2050, 2060. We've been doing SRM for 25, uh, uh, 30 years. But then things nevertheless start to really fall apart in a big way. Now we face the, the horrifying possibility of a sudden jump in, in temperatures when we stop doing SRM within a period of just a, uh, one year, two years, three years, which could be much more destabilizing even than the, the deadly gradual rise of temperatures that we set ourselves on path for. So I think that for the reason that we can no longer guarantee that our civilization or anything like it is going to continue, uh, SRM is an unacceptable gamble. Although if the collapse of civilization is going to be driven by climate change, you'd think an idea that reduces the impacts of climate change would reduce the risk of that collapse. Of course it would, but if you can't reduce that risk to zero, and I've argued why you can't reduce that risk to zero, because you're not aware of the silent risks uh, that go with it. If you can't reduce that risk to, to zero, it's still an unacceptable gamble. Sorry, which silent risks? 
Well, the science, you, but we don't know what they are, right? All the, all the, all the possibilities that make up so, so stuff to do with, you know, sulfuric acid at scale in the atmosphere endlessly. Are we going to get acid rain on a scale we've never seen before, for example? Possibilities like that and other possibilities that are complete uh, uh, black swans, uh, plus the, the, the stuff which, uh, which, as I say, is really, really terrifying me now of, um, of the way that ocean acidification could uh, interact um, with, um, uh, with the climate situation uh, to, to, to bring us down within a relatively short period of time, a period of time of a few decades. So, so there are various possible scenarios but under which SRM would not head off apocalypse. If, the, if we get apocalypse and we've had SRM, we'll have apocalypse squared. Well, I mean, I think it's worth coming to the uncertainties, perhaps, because um, Yes, stratospheric aerosol, geoengineering stratospheric SRM would add to um, the acid rain problem. We're adding, we'd add 10 to 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide to the stratosphere. It would create a permanent acid rain problem, probably. Well, we currently have an acid rain problem that peaked in the 80s. 140 million tons of sulfur dioxide was added every year, primarily in the West. Um, now that's shifting to the East. But still today, we're at about 80, um, or is it 100 megatons per year added to the atmosphere. So this would add to that problem. 10 to 20 megatons, but it is a relatively small contribution to an existing problem. But it would be essentially permanent. The, on the permanence angle, if you wanted to, to keep the benefit of cooling, you would need to keep this running. To dr the current plan, plan A for climate change, that at least is followed by governments, is that we'll cut emissions rapidly, or as rapidly as we can. Temperature will then peak, and it will stay there until we drive CO2 down. Carbon dioxide removal is being discussed seriously as a way of doing that. It'll be slow. It'll take decades, many decades, perhaps a century or two to drive temperatures back that way. So plan A plus, if we were to add solar radiation management, would be to limit warming, say, to one and a half Celsius, and then keep CO2, as, eliminate it as fast as possible, and then drive it down with CDR. This means that if we were to keep warming at one and a half Celsius with SRM, we could be doing it for decades or, or even a Century. Many decades. Right? Many decades. But at any point, we could phase it out. If you turn it off tomorrow, you'll get a rapid warming, absolutely. Mm -hmm. About a quarter in a year, a half in a decade, and three quarters in a century of the, of the warming you've offset. Now, you could phase things out. It doesn't need to be put on permanently. If we use it to halt warming for a few decades, we could then spend a few decades unwinding that. That would buy us considerable time to mm. adapt and cope with the impacts of climate change. And I, that, that was the point that I was going to try and bring up there about adaptation. And we talked about, I think it's one of the, the key themes at, at COP is adaptation and resilience. And, and clearly we're on a, a path that is potentially very fast and very rapid into, in terms of, um, of the danger there. You brought up the point that it may give us time to adapt. Um, to changing climate. What, I mean, Rupert, what do you see in terms of that kind of adaptation program? Where, are we, where should we be focusing and prioritizing the way that we adapt? Are there things that SRM could, in fact, help us to buy extra time to do some of those? those? Well, yeah, of course it could, in theory. Uh, and, you know, maybe things would go in the kind of sweet spot uh, way that, uh, that Pete uh, just described. Um, I would still be very troubled by the thought that that on the sort of best case scenario there, uh, basically, we're looking at several uh, decades of uh, full scale um, SRM. Um, and if, as I think is quite likely, um, climate and ocean acidification um, uh, take out uh, many of our civilizations before the end of that, um, then we're into a situation where things are um, horribly worse because we've got to had a sudden loss. Uh, of SRM. But to come to your question, I, th I think it's a really helpful question because as I see it, SRM is a form of adaptation. It's a sort of extreme uh, form of, uh, of defensive uh, adaptation. Um, uh, what I want to see uh, is transformative adaptation. Uh, which uh, is uh, what's argued for in, in my book that I think you're going to advertise at the end. Uh, well, it's not my book, my, <laughs> my think tank's book, um, uh, Facing Up to Climate Reality. And what transformative adaptation uh, means um, is that we undertake uh, system change, uh, we mitigate at the same time um, as we uh, adapt. We work with nature rather than against nature or trying to put ourselves uh, above nature. It's a much more humble uh, way of proceeding. It will, by the way, um, 
have within it enormous uh, scope for job opportunities for engineers of, of all kind, uh, but they won't be uh, operating so much at the global level as at the as at the local uh, level. Um, I think when um, when uh, COP26 fails us, there are sort of two different ways to go, really. Uh, one is down the track of saying, right, things are now getting desperate enough that we, we need to uh, roll the dice and do something like SRM. Uh, the other is to say, uh, right, we need to get um, far more serious about uh, changing the course of our civilization. Uh, and transformative adaptation is one of the headlines for what that seriousness would look like. Thank you. Um... I think uh, bringing it back, we've had a f a quite a few te more technical questions on SRM um, and actually thinking about the system and how it may affect um, other significant progresses that we've made. So looking at energy production and renewable energy production, um, Ian Sturrocks asked, um, would SRM material effect, materially affect the efficiency or the output of Earth-based solar power arrays? So if we're looking at yeah. uh, affecting the amount of sunlight that comes in, are we potentially yeah, removing a potential renewable energy source? We would not be removing it, absolutely not. So um, most of, there's two types of solar power, uh, solar photovoltaic, the sort of the flat ones that you see on roofs. Now they just take light from any direction. And so as to offset about one Celsius of warming, you need to turn the sun down by about 1%, or well, 1% less sunlight would to reach the surface. So they'd be 99% efficient compared to today. The other type of solar power is concentrating solar power. You might have seen these big tall towers with a set of mirrors aiming the sun at them. They only work when there's direct sunlight coming in. So if you offset about 1% of incoming sunlight, you actually scatter about another 4% to make it diffuse light, sort of the hazy light that you see on those days. So that would drop the, their efficiency from 100% to 95%. So it would have some effect. Okay. Um, we've had a question from Leanne B. It's Asking you, Rupert, um, when you say transform, transformative adaptation, could you give some examples of what, what that might be and, and what, you're, what you're talking about there? Yeah. So uh, let's go back to uh, Scott Morrison's government in Australia. So they came out uh, in favour of, uh, of adaptation uh, last year, so sort of, sort of sudden converts to adaptation. Um, they sort of skipped the whole kind of mitigation stage and went straight to, uh, uh, to adaptation. And what they mean by that is shallow, defensive, incremental adaptation. So, for example, they mean things like more hard flood defences on, on rivers, uh, more hard flood defences on, on coasts and so on and so forth. Um, as I see it, uh, SRM is that same kind of mentality at global scale. It's saying, you know, we're going to stop the water rising. We're going to stop uh, the sun rays uh, coming in. Transformative uh, adaptation would, by analogy with the, um, uh, the flood defense issue, would be things like um, restoring uh, mangroves, restoring uh, uh, wetlands, um, um, w creating ways of, um, uh, of uh, working with nature rather than against nature in the sense of um, uh, rather than trying to wall stuff or, or barrier stuff out, uh, try, would be, it'd be more allowing it in uh, in creative uh, ways that we wouldn't have full control over. Um, but my point earlier was defensive adaptation, adaptation gives you an illusion of control. Um, you, you don't have control over what you have uh, control uh, over. You don't have control by definition of all the things uh, uh, that you can't see and can't perceive. Um, uh, so it's better for us to take a kind of um, more humble in one sense, but also massively, massively more ambitious in another sense uh, uh, approach to what we're trying to do here. Uh, and I think that uh, after COP26 fails us, there will be a big increase in people looking to approaches such as uh, transformative adaptation, um, whether that is done by governments or um, more often uh, for the foreseeable future, whether it's done by communities and NGOs and so on and so forth, uh, who um, recognize that actually our so-called leaders have chronically failed us here. I guess one thought there is, I think, while some transformative adaptation might be, be nice in some places, I mean, London is at threat of flooding from sea level rise and storms. We've built the Thames barrier because sea levels have risen by 20 centimeters. We're already using it more often than it was originally designed for. We're gonna need another new Thames barrier, or do you propose that we sort of pull back from parts of London so that, and let them flood? I'm a little confused. 
Well, when you come to a, a, a city like uh, like London, yeah, there are going to be some hard uh, uh, forks in the road to be faced. It's not clear that we're going to be able to hold on to all the, the big coastal cities uh, that we've got. Uh, if we try to insist that we will, um, that's going to have a very heavy um, uh, carbon cost. It's going to have a, a very heavy cost also in terms of um, the resources that get and the energy that gets poured into that rather than thinking about a, a future which is actually uh, going, to, going to work. Um, sooner, sooner or later, um, you're going to have to um, uh, face up to the extent to which um, if we don't move, if we don't transform to a, to a future in which we've got radically uh, uh, less um, carbon going into the atmosphere uh, uh, and radically more um, uh, nature to uh, absorb the carbon that's, uh, that's in the atmosphere, um, that then cities are going to flood anyway. Well, I mean, surely it'll be more expensive to move London <laughs> than to build a new flood defence. I mean, it's... Yeah, the, the, we're, I mean, look, sea levels, I, are, sea levels are rising. I'm not, yeah, look, I'm not saying don't build any more new hard flood defences. Sure. What I'm saying is if what we focus on is, is, uh, is, is barriers to water and barriers to sun, then we're on the road to perdition. We need to, the overarching frame should be something like transformative adaptation. And any defensive adaptations that we do should be only what we are absolutely unable to avoid doing within that frame, rather than being the thing we resort to first. OK. Um, we, we've got 10 more minutes. And, and I suppose we, we always try and end on a high, <laughs> on a positive note. And we've, we've talked a lot about. Uh, quite a lot of society needing to do different things. Governments need to make different decisions, clearly funding or, or quite a large technological uh, change that, that we're talking about with SRM. Um, for me as a person, if I put myself in the shoes, the shoes of the, the person on the street, the, the, clearly we're advocating quite, quite um, radical changes in lifestyle and behaviour as well as the, this technological bit. Do, we think, do you think we obviously need a balance in those because the danger is presumably that, that society, if there's no technological change or, or, or sense that there is a, a real uh, solution to this, that, that people will just go, well, there's no point and I'm just going to give up. Um, do you think SRM has a role to play in, in Kane kind of giving people hope that there is still time and there is still something that we can do? Yeah, I mean, I guess first I would say I think Rupert's view that society is close to collapse or will be driven to collapse by climate change is not a mainstream climate science projection. That's not what, I mean, the IPCC is about to do a new report. It's not report a climate on... science projection at all. I mean, it's a systems projection, mm. right? It's, it's thinking that goes beyond the thinking that can be engaged in any one discipline. Okay. Well, I, I think few climate scientists believe that society, especially in the West, will collapse due to climate change. But we do worry about people at the margins. So the greatest impacts of climate change will fall on the developing world. The urban poor in the newly growing cities in the tropics, they will suffer the greatest impacts of climate change. Uh, and we'll have a serious migration threat too. Uh, but there are stuff we can do, even without SRM on the table. Like we can cut emissions, we've got the technology, the ambitions are not high enough today, but we are moving in the right direction slowly, but we're moving. And yeah, I think adaptation is going to be key. We will not let London flood, or we better not. <laughs> we will build new and better defenses. But yeah, I believe that stratospheric SRM, this idea, has the potential to reduce risks further than we could even with really ambitious emissions cuts. Um, so I think it's an idea we should explore. We should not bank on it. Absolutely not. We've got to focus in the near term on cutting emissions. Like, holding the government's feet to the fire on their 2030 pledges. Are they going to achieve them? Are they going to better them? Not looking so far out. But I think this is an idea that has some real potential and should be explored, but we can't rely on it at this stage. And I guess my view is that I, I'm, I, I'm, I think it's great we're discussing it. Um, I'm really worried that, uh, that many powerful governments in the world, Australian governments, Middle Eastern governments, the North American government potentially, British government potentially, Indian government even perhaps, many powerful governments in the world um, will seek to use SRM in effect while denying that they're doing it uh, as an excuse uh, for, for not actually making us climate safe. Um, I accept that, uh, that my view on how much at risk we are um, is not yet uh, a mainstream view, but it's becoming um, alarmingly more credible with every passing um, 
climate disaster, every new report, etc. And there are now a substantial number of scholars who have, who have been willing to put their head above the parapet and say that this kind of risk should be taken seriously, existential risk. You could find it if you're interested by going to scholars warning, um, scholars warning on, on potential uh, collapse. Even if you think there's only a small chance of, uh, of eco-driven um, societal or civilizational collapse, then the precautionary principle enjoins uh, that you should take very seriously all possible measures to prevent that. Those measures to be considered should include drastic paths such as geoengineering. But if there is a safe path that does not take uh, such, a, such a drastic experimental approach to our entire planet, then that is what, be, what should be pursued. So that is why I argue for um, an emergency crash program of emissions reduction for transformative adaptation and for deep adaptation, which means um, pre preparation for the potentiality of actual um, uh, societal collapse. And I want to come back again to this very real danger that we may not have um, the opportunity, if we choose to go down the SRM path, we may not have the opportunity to gradually taper off. We may have a, a, a cliff uh, that we suddenly uh, go off. And the, the scenarios, you know, we really don't have no idea what would happen if that were to happen. But as best as we can uh, work out, and you know, Pete and many others, I'm sure, have been doing uh, this work for, for some time now, as best as we can work out, it would be absolutely horrendous. A, a, really, rapid, uh, a really rapid temperature rise over the course of, uh, of a couple of years, a, a sort of bouncing of all the sort of suppressed, masked uh, warming, or not even all of it, but most of it. Um, that's the kind of thing that causes mass extinctions. Yeah. Um, we're almost up. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating. I've really, really enjoyed being here on, on stage with you two. Um, I feel out of my depth, partly, but it's brilliant. It's lovely to have you here. And I wonder if we could kind of get a, a couple of minutes um, uh, a closing remarks uh, from you both. Um, and also, I, I'll talk about the book as well, but um, Pete, maybe before your closing remarks, where can people find uh, more information on, on things that you're working on? Yeah, so I'm Pete Irvin on Twitter, um, I-R-V-I-N-E, and I'm starting a new podcast in January called Challenging Climate. So you can check it out there. Um, yeah, also a lot of my publications are open access, so you can find them on the internet. Um, I guess to closing, um, this idea, stratospheric, SRM is feasible, and it looks at this early stage that it might help. Uh, but I think we've both been clear this is not a substitute for emissions cuts. There is no plan B for the climate. There's only plan A, cut emissions, adapt, and perhaps carbon dioxide removal, and then plan A plus SRM. So those and as well, this idea to reduce, um, reduce temperatures through solar radiation management. Now, as I said, the Early studies are suggesting that this could reduce risks compared to a case of just cutting emissions. And I think that means we should take it seriously. But at this stage, we simply do not know enough to know whether we should integrate this uh, into climate policy. We need more research, we need more international cooperation, and we need more public discussion, more events like this. Brilliant. And um, Rupert, uh, as you mentioned the book earlier, uh, Facing Up to Climate Reality, there's selected chapters there, Honesty, Disaster, and Hope, that you, that you put together. And, um, Thank you for that. That's Greenhouse Think Tank. Uh, and I wonder if you could give us your, your two-minute closing remarks before we, before we finish. Yeah, well, like, like Pete and like you, James, I, I'm really pleased that we're here debating this. This is the kind of thing that we need to do. Uh, and what I would say in, uh, in closing is to urge people to look into this more. If you want to follow me, I'm also easily findable on Twitter, Green Rupert Reed or Rupert Reed. You take your pick or follow both. Um, and um, to mention also um, a source that you might want to look up if you want to check out what I've been saying about um, acidification and the worries there. This, this is the recent uh, think piece by the GOES uh, Institute, G-O-E-S, who are basically marine um, scientists, uh, suggesting that we may have not had our, ball, our eye on the ball um, of ocean acidification uh, enough. Um, and I think as we look into this more and discuss it more, uh, we need to try to consider um, all of the potential uh, side effects of, of SRM uh, while recognizing that we'll never know what they all are, but we need to consider them all as best we can. Uh, and that is, that is the one which is the most concerning of all to me. If we provide cover for continued acidification of the oceans, it may affect far, far more than just coral reefs. It may be an existential issue for, for civilization and possibly for the species. Brilliant, thank you. And um, 
I suppose to finish, we, we have COP26 coming up in November. Um, I would encourage everyone who's watching to keep, keep an eye on that and, 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 and comment and, and get involved with it. And, and we've said now there's, there's no silver bullets to anything. It requires extraordinarily clever experts working on all sorts of a variety of solutions and, and uh, changes in the way that we're adapting. We're, we're engaging the public, we're engaging society at large. Um, all of that needs to carry on going. So please do keep an eye on, on COP. Um, the last thing for me to do is, is say thank you very much. I've been James Robottom at the IET. Um, a thank you from Pete. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you from Rupert. And, and thank you to, to everyone who watched uh, and asked questions. And um, enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you.